Okay, right. Um, yeah, I'm going to have a talk, talk about um, a period over the last 12,000 years um, when the world literally was different. Uh, it's, quite, it's frequent that people refer to um, you know, the past as a foreign country, but there were times when, when it really, really, really and truly was foreign. We're very comfortable with how we see Britain and ourselves, I suspect, in the world. Um, you know, the British, of course, the famous island race, and the great newspaper headline of the 60s was Fog in the Channel, Europe cut off. Mm. Not Britain, it was definitively not that way. But the point about that is more that we, about the fact that we see ourselves in this shape, and the idea that Britain and our characters might not have been entirely island based is something else. Now, though I'll concentrate on that to begin with, of course, what I'm really going to be talking about is the area of the North Sea, centered on the area of the Dogger Bank. And if you don't listen to Radio 4 um, weather forecasts, that's where the Dogger Bank is, is, is today. But the world was a foreign country. Since the 18,000 BC, the, the, the end of the last glacial maximum, the sea level rise was about 120 metres globally. Britain wasn't a foreign country, it was northwest France. I mean, you know, it was very, very di different indeed. Most of the um, area of the, the, the Norwegian ch Channel here was, in fact, Europe in 18,000 BC at the glacial low stand. But the area, the period I'm going to be talking about, is effectively the early Holocene onwards, when Britain was connected um, by a great bank, a great plain to um, northwest Europe and through, and through to Denmark. The point about that is, of course, the foreign country, it really was a foreign country. This was a period when the whole world was different. It wasn't the shape we understood it. The landscape itself clearly wasn't the same. During this period, we had massive changes in temperature as glaciation ended. Um, it wasn't a linear event. There were cold stands. There was, there, was, there was periods of relative warmth. We moved from tundra through to open woodland, to the closed forest canopy in the, in the early Holocene. And, of course, the countryside itself wasn't the same. We're very used to seeing Britain as this green and pleasant land. But in fact, most of the valleys that you see around you are the product of the Bronze Age, Iron Age onwards. Um, this is more what um, British valleys would have looked like. Riffling streams over, over gravel bases. It was a very, very, very different, different landscape indeed. This was not Britain. It was truly foreign. Everything about it was foreign. The practices of the people who lived in this country were foreign. It was not Britain. Now, the, this, it is, you know, on occasions when we talk about this, also like to think that um, um, everything we did, we did ourselves. Well, the discovery or the exploration of this other world, of course, was not just the work of Birmingham, and certainly not just me as a part of a much larger team, but it actually goes back a century. This book, in particular, Clement Reed, who joined the Geological Survey in 1874, um, this person. Um, is in his books so have recently been republished, published in 1913, something called Submerged Forests. Reed was an interesting guy. I mean, he was um, a typical self-made um, academic of the time. He worked in the publishers. He came from a family with some distinguished scientific um, um, linkage. But, um, you know, he had to work hard to become a, ge ge a geologist before he joined the Geological Survey, working in his spare time. And he became um, an, an expert in British geology and paleobotany. Uh, you can see from his portrait, he was clearly a driven man. Eyes like that, well, you know, like so coming across in a dark alley. Um, and he's wonderful because even in his obituary, um, they noted that Clement was not necessarily an easy person to get on with. When they write that in your obituary, you know it means something, right? <laughs> no one beats reserved for some person. But what was important for us, apart from the fact that he solved the drainage issues of Cyprus, uh, is that he wrote this book. He looked at the occurrences of fossil, of fossil woods around the areas of Britain and to use it to, to, to study what he saw was the option to look at really dramatic 
clue coastal change in Britain. He saw that there were a series of levels of preserved organics, peats, and, um, and these actually wonderful um, forests preserved far below the lowest spring tides. And he concluded that there had to be evidence of major sea level or, co or, 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 or coastal change. It wasn't just that there was compression of landscape or anything like this. Um, the locals at the time used to know them as Noah's Woods, so they clearly had a, an explanation for them. But something antediluvian was not what he was on his mind at the, at the time. And in fact, from looking at this, uh, the evidence from um, Wales and, and England, um, he concluded, he took this massive leap of faith, and he just said, at one point, actually in, the, in one of the chapters, in this wonderful book, um, that there must have been a great big plane attaching Britain to the mainland at some point. And he looked out, actually, in his final chapter and said, it's Dogger Bank that we want to be looking, looking at. He set us a shoreline at 36 bathymetric um, um, feet, and he produced this wonderful map. He put rivers onto it, and this was the first evidence, or the first proposal of what was to become Dogger Land. But there was a real problem, because he had an idea that this was a landscape. He had an idea that there were people who lived on this landscape. But he could not date it. It was a real issue. He looked at the, uh, whether there was metal work in these, in, these, in these forests. He saw that there was not metal work. Um, he looked at the contemporary um, evidence for, um, for, for, um, for human development. He came to the conclusion that inundation of this landscape called, began around 3000 BC and ended about 1600 BC. And what he said, because he had no alternative, was that perhaps we may find submerged stone circles here. The age of Stonehenge, well, he wasn't entirely wrong about that, was he? But, however, like the archaeologists of his days, he grasped at the obvious straw. One day our submerged forests may yield an article of Egyptian manufacture, passed from hand to hand until it reached a country still living in the Stone Age. But well, of course, we're still waiting for the for, the, for the Egyptian standards from there. But it was the truth was he couldn't do anything with it. He made a great observation, an observation that was very very practical, and he went on to it and he said, you know, these are areas that geologists should be able to study changes of sea level. He said antiquarians, archaeologists, should be able to find all the stuff preserved here, leather. Wood, basket work, and the, which isn't preserved anywhere else. And if this isn't uh, a, an object lesson for this particular site, what is? But then he's made an observation. In the end, he said, these seem, forests seem to be of little interest. The archaeologists in kind of say they belong to the province of geology, and the geologist remarks they are too modern to be worth his attention, and both pass on. And he was absolutely right. For a long time, his work was almost entirely ignored. And in fact, when I got his book out um, from the Birmingham Library, um, was when I first started becoming interested in it, it was notable, like, like all classics. No one had got it out since before I was born. And I'm not 21. <laughs> right? um, you know, I, it, it, 1957 was the last time that book had been brought and got out of the library. Right. Now, well, one of the things, of course, that, he had, that they had at the time, um, which held people back, with the complaint, um, really was a geologist after all, but there was no concept of what the early Holocene actually meant, archaeological. There wasn't even a standard term for the period, which became the Mesolithic. It existed as a term, some people called it Epipaleolithic, or various proto-Neolithic terms, depending on whether you believed it was the Neolithic pushed back or the Paleolithic pushed forward. It was, it was clearly, it was not defined. It took, of course, um, Clark, the great doyen of the Mesolithic, in a series of publications to, uh, to, to bring this era into some sort of contrast. Um, it sums it up that his own supervisor in his introduction to the Mesolithic Age in 32 referred to the period as miserable but not at all despicable. I mean, you know, that was his supervisor. That's the sort of um, academic referee you want, isn't it? <laughs> you know, like, you know, but, the, but the point was that it, it, there, were, it, there was nothing to define this, pe this period in archaeological terms. And even, even, even Clark himself 
in his first group, did not much to, to, to change that except to define it in artifactual terms. People were not, it was a, his, his PhD was a gazetteer of stuff. That was it, and that was pretty much how most archaeological periods were treated, of course, at, at that time. But the appendix, one appendix in this book, was significant, and it related to this. Because in just in, 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 the, in, in 32, this point, this harpoon, what was called a harpoon, the cleaner harpoon, was pulled out by the, a, 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 a small um, trawler off the Le Mandendua banks. This is, a, this is the thing that was brought out. And the wonderfully named Lee Pilgrim Lockwood, the skipper, says, you know, we're halfway between the two boys. I heard the shuttle strike something, because this is a, these big blocks of peat were being pulled out of the banks all the time. People had seen them, it had lots of them, fossil remains in them, generally animal, but not many people thought much about it. You heard they broke these big bits of peat, and this one is apparently about a metre cube, this thing that was pulled up at the time. Um, so they ch chopped it up because they damaged the nets. He bent down and took whatever he heard the shuttle strike below. It was in the middle of a block, four feet by three feet deep. I wiped it clean and saw an object quite black. And that was it. He pulled out this half this, this bone point, possibly part of a fish nest or something like that. And um, he brought it home, he gave it to the, um, to the, to his, uh, the, the guy who owned the, the boat, he sent it to the British Museum, and the British Museum said, no thank you, we've got one already. Yeah. <laughs> Not free, they, they said it's Magnolosian, it's, a, it's a, this period of which we, we know very little, um, and, it, and it came back. But what was important? was that it was exhibited at the um, Prehistoric Society at uh, Big Stangler, which became the Prehistoric Society at later date, and um, it created quite a kerfuffle, to the point that Sir Harry Godwin actually asked Edwin Muir, the, um, the people who originally talked to, um, to Lockwood, to provide some, in, some, some of the um, samples of the, of the um, peats which were around the um, the, um, the, the, the point. Now that's quite interesting. A very interesting point. The first thing is that um, they took, they got some peats and, and they looked at it and they said this is not a marine environment. This thing was not dropped in this in, in this in the sea. It was dropped effectively on land. It was a mix of woodland. And this was Harry Cobham, the fathers of um, palynology um, within Britain. However, that statement changed clock. It changed entirely in how he looked at the, at, at the, at the, the early Holocene. He saw that it was a period of massive environmental change. He saw that the archaeological evidence reflected that change one way or another, and it set him on the road to create a concept of the Mesolithic. That's important. What is quite interesting, though, is that the evidence that's based on isn't actually from the point that the harpoon came from. Because actually, Pilgrim Lockwood went back to get some, some peat from just about where it came from. That's a bit of an archaeological myth, is this particular, this particular um, tale. But nonetheless, nonetheless, what is correct is that it started to change how people looked at the period. This me shady people period when there were no people, there were people you couldn't put your hands on, it was represented by lithics, you couldn't really understand, but was clearly associated with major um, environmental change became important. And Clark went away and he founded the Fenland Research Committee in the upper parlour at Peter House. Now that's very interesting. They went out in order to, in order to look at the, the scale of landscape change, pulling together geology, archaeology, environmental scientists as they, what they wish. The committee included wonderful Clark and Godwin's, not surprising, Stuart Piggott, and Christopher Hawkes, the doyen of the ABC of the Iron Age. You know, these were well, met when I was an undergraduate as well. It's, uh, it's self lodge just before he died, but that's good enough. Um, but, you know, they, they, these people got together under the watchful eye of South and Seward, who was, uh, I think, a member of the university put there to make sure they didn't screw up. Um, and they went out, they did a series of excavations, the most famous one is um, perhaps Peacock's Farm, and that's the depth down to the 
the, 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 the early Holocene. That photograph is truly iconic. It's got the clock down there at the basal peaks, and it's got Major Gordon Fowler, the, the local fixer, the local beat factory manager, up, up on the top there. And if that doesn't give you an ex sense of, of, um, of change at the time, nothing, nothing can. But at the end of this, all Clark actually had was still the Le Mans and Pont. When he, see, he, he was aware of the change, he could start to conclude something about the nature of, um, of, of, of early Holocene societies from terrestrial deposits, but at the same time, the only thing that actually populated the Southern North Sea was this single pond. And you know, he himself said, it'd be really good if we could just say that there's nothing out there, but we can't. So these were probably, he said, the best places to live. If you look, thought about it, this is a, you know, this is a Pez Res of the early, early Holocene, you know, the Great Plain, not the hills surrounding it. <coughs> and, you know, he established the Mesolithic, he set its chronological bounds, its cultural bounds. We can't say nothing happened, but the truth was, in terms of the Holocene development, um, it was a sparse environment. It was living, you know, making out in scarce resources. That's what hunter gatherers do, and it's what, uh, you know, Mesolithic archaeologists did to some extent. I mean, Stark Carr, of course, was done by, uh, by um, 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 Clark and famous South, um, the front that's pierced, shamanic or hunting, whatever you wish. But for most people, still, the Mesolithic was just a bundle of very small things. You know, which you went from the Paleolithic, which was quite spectacular, through to the Neolithic, when you eventually had a pottery and some parties. You know, I mean, that's how it went. It was different. It was not. It was not apparently inspiring. The other, of course, of course strange thing is that the, even through the so my period as an undergraduate, we appreciated that we had structures like shell mittens, which actually anticipated the importance of them. Um, of, um, of coastal environments to these periods, and yet, of course, um, these were a late um, Mesolithic um, um, innovation. We suddenly learned um, to love shellfish in the late Mesolithic. Well, actually, of course, we didn't have the coastlines of the early Mesolithic, so you're not going to be able to say much about that, really. Post for the here. Um, but, of course, things have changed. Say that things have not changed. Of course, Martin Bell's wonderful work in Gold Cliff in the Seven Estuary. I mean, if you ever wanted to work, to walk with the with with your your ancestors, this is of course it. This the coastal flats of the Lake Mesolithic, which provide all these animal prints, wolf, turn heron. Of course, also have human prints as well. And we're seeing these more and more where the, these um, coastal environments can preserve. But the, what it really shows, what it really shows. It's not just the, the fact that it's wonderful things like you can see children walk along the shores, which you can in these, but it's the intensity of use of these, these environments for very small amounts of time, a couple of hours, and people are running all over these places, and you know, presumably not just to get their feet wet. You know, these are desirable areas, but these are the things, of course, that we miss in the, in, in for much of the area. Of, of the of the of the but, um, Can I just pause you for a second? Yeah. For those of you who didn't recognize the footprints oh, on, on the previous slide, um, <clears throat> if we can just head back really yeah. quickly, you what you're seeing there are uh, Mesolithic footprints preserved um, it, in the actual on the actual beach. You can still see those at certain points of the <coughs> time. And what what they realize is what it shows is an adult walking along the seashore and a child basically running around next to them. In, in basically the same way that you see these children are, enjoying the beach these, today. These are wonderful, wonderful. There's patterns. ones at Crosby. At Crosby, these are, on, these are at Gold Cliff, these particular examples in southern mm. South Wales. But um, mm. now, they're, they're starting to appear in a number of places. Now people believe them. Mm. You know, in the past, um, you wouldn't have regarded that as archaeology. You'd have just regarded it as someone who was there two hours earlier. Yeah. Mm. Sorry? I was just wondering how you knew how old they were. And they're strat they've got stratified deposits in, the, in there. They've got, they're also in, they've got um, the woodlands preserved in, as well in some places. Actually, these are where these fossilized forests actually occur. Mm. Other things, though, are also there that suggest 
suggest complexity. Um, things like Mount Sand have been known for some time, but the excavation of a large hut, for instance, at Howick, up in the Thumbland. Um, wasn't found like that. <laughs> but, um, you know, I mean, there, there's an, an early Scottish example of things of the sort that were found in, um, in, in, in Mount Sandal, these bender like kind of structures. You know, there, there was clearly more to the, the period, of which we're also just starting to find some areas, but also in liminal areas, in coastlines and, and rivers and in place in, in specific areas, much of which, of course, was not rep well represented in the enemies in, in the early Holocene, the early Mesolithic. Now, it's not that people hadn't been mapping these areas or looking at them before, but there was a confusion of maps and the maps, which were probably the most honest to us, the least. You know, there's a couple of, of shoreline uh, maps from the um, from the late 90s. And it's quite recent. It's quite it's quite recent. Um, you know, 99, 98, uh, new, very generalized, not particularly much information on there. Um, but this particular paper started getting people to think. 98, when Professor Brian Nichols from Exeter produced a, book, a, a um, paper entitled Doggerland, a Speculative Survey. And what she said, what she did, was she pulled all the data that she could come, she could find, <coughs> to produce a series of maps which approximated what happened from the last late, late glacial maximum, the, 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 the late glacial maximum. And she put, put together a series of maps showing how Britain was part of the much larger landmass and it retreated. But she herself carefully said it's a speculative survey. All of this detail is largely um, approximated or best guess. She had stopped said, well, about the archaeology, we have no more than a clock hat in 36. You know, it really was that bad. But she started to get people to think, and that was the important thing. Because by then, the worst thing in the world had happened. The worst thing in the world had happened. Because this area in the North Sea had become a land bridge. It was something through which people walked from Britain, or from Europe, to become British. That was it, you know? Um, it was not somewhere you lived. It became mentally something which was, which was very, very peripheral. And you can see that all the way through, even now you have to say the Britain, Britain BC. You can you will say it quite as recent as that. It was formative in a very negative way. It formed the British perception of the early, 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 early Mesolithic. And she began to change it. She gave the area a name for the first time since you know, the early Holocene as well, possibly. Doggerland, named after the Dogger Banks, which, of course, Clement Reed had said was where we should be looking. Now, there's lots of stuff being done in the North Sea. But why do we find so little? I mean, the numbers of terrestrial finds in comparison to, um, to marine finds are minuscule. And the obvious reason is because the contemporary land surface doesn't come thin to the Holocene. There's lots of trawling, and trawling brings up stuff. And then um, this is just short trawl lines um, from, from, from vehicles of depth and um, length of greater than 15 meters. Lots of stuff going on there, but we don't have much evidence. But other people were looking at the, at the North Sea as well. And 12 years ago, I used to do a seminar in which I used to talk about landscapes with which we could do nothing. In one year, we're doing the one, this as usual, and in fact, I produced a slide which I showed every year of the Kalinda Harpoon. and said, look, we can't do anything with this. We know it's out there, but we can't do anything. One person that I was talking to said, well, we can surely do something because lots of people are mapping the North Sea. They must have evidence. Why don't we go and talk to them? What about the oil companies? And that interested us because then we started thinking, what do oil companies do? Well, they, do, they process huge amounts of geological mapping. And they have invested billions of dollars because it's oil and gas. You know, not because it's archaeology, that's for certain. And the interesting thing that we were particularly interested was 3D seismics. It's these sorts of things, right? Great big ocean going 
and um, vessels pulled behind them streamers with um, with with, uh, with, um, with seismic sources and um, various receivers on and let them blow a big boom or a pain or whatever type of um, equipment they're using. It goes the sort of the, the, the seismic wave is reflected at various um, um, at various um, 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 boundaries within the geology for them. There's a great big uh, tunnel valley, and you can map it in 2D slices. But the 3D data is interesting because you put all that data together, you can slice it, you can dice it in a way which is much like ground penetrating radar is today. But actually, GPR, all the software comes from the oil and gas industry. It's all der derivative. You can put these things in what are called volume models, and you can strip the, 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 the landscape apart. And then if not just that, you can produce chronostratigraphies. You can have geological features, which you can, you can identify and show the relative stratigraphic relationships as well. There'll be a test on this slide later. Um, but it's there for you if you really want to know how the thing works. But it actually, the data that we use is relatively coarse. It has generally a vertical resolution of 27 meters, but possibly up to 10 meters um, in, with the, in, in the, uh, the high frequency components. Seven years ago, we looked at it, in, well, probably nine years ago, and we said we've got to get a little bit of data to test this out. And we looked at um, whether we could do this in an area in Pool Bay. We've got one bit of 3D data that looked, of course, Britain's largest oil um, and gas, uh, oil um, 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 well, somewhere over here. I have actually seen the nodding donkey at one point. Um, and you know, hence that this 3D data is there. This is the geological mapping of the um, of the of the rivers flowing into Pool Bay, Christchurch Bay. But once we looked at the data, we said, "Oh, yes, that's where they are. That's real reality." What that said to us is, one, we could trace rivers and quite quite easily, and also that most other earlier um, geological and archaeological interpretations of this sort of data were wrong. So, I went and saw a friend of mine called Ken Thompson, and I said, Ken, we need someone to give us several hundred million dollars worth of data. Do you know anyone? He's a Jason geomorphologist. He said, yep, a group called PGS, they do this sort of thing. I'll take you down to talk to them. And then we went down to, um, down to Berkshire, to the office. We said, we're looking for a lost world called Dogger Land. We didn't call security, that was good. <laughs> um, at which point they said, uh, they said, well, we know Ken Thompson, he's not an idiot, don't know about you, but, you know, okay, we're prepared to help you. We used to produce great big migrated data sets, seismic data sets for the oil industry, but we're only prepared to give you a very small amount of information to work with because we don't believe what you're telling us. Mm. Because it's a well-known fact that this sort of work doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't work. He said, but we'll only give you a small amount of data. So they gave us 6,000 square kilometers of seismic data in the center of, um, of the Dogger Bank. And we went away with it. <coughs> and two weeks later, we had a river flowing through the, do the top of the Dogger Bank. You do not need to be a geomorphologist to see the river there. You can see tributary streams. It changes color because there's a geological change there. And there's a series of basins in there as well. We immediately called it the Shotton River after the, uh, the man who studied the Bythen Pally River from Birmingham, um, Fred Shotton. And we looked at it with the data that had been used for reconstruction um, of paleo landscapes in the North Sea previously, which is bathymetry. And surprise, surprise, it clearly didn't work because that's the river and it flows uphill. And of course, the point about that is the dogger banks as they stand, which people have been using since Reed's day for reconstruction, are mainly the product of all the rivers flowing out of Northwest Europe and that post depositional patterns of a huge amount of junk just dumped on the bottom. So, obviously, what we're seeing, and what we thought we were seeing, was an early Holocene landscape which existed beneath those topographic highs. It would have obviously been relatively high, but there were really hills. It was sort of like pink once more, and I think more very gentle. So this was this was, this this immediately said we were going to do something different. But we looked to see whether it was real. This is a slice, 
<coughs> probably through this particular river. There you can see the channels within the sediments there. You, know, you can see the slices within, within the stratigraphy. Um, we checked it against um, high resolution seismic lines um, produced, um, this is the Gauss 95 line and the BGS survey, so that the channels that we're looking at, you can see there, conformed, we thought, to early Holocene stratigraphy. We looked at the generalised geology maps, and some of the channels we looked at were associated with botany cut sediments, that means that they're early Holocene as well. And all in all, we started to think we were under something here. We can see that we've got Holocene channel formation, and that we've got depths at a depth depths of uh, 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 you know 20 to, to 30 meters or more, um, and they conform to the known geology. It seems that we were onto getting out solid early Holocene landscape features. And when we looked at it, they weren't just early Holocene as well. Because this is the early Holocene channel, which you looked at there. There's a geological non-conformatory, a tributary. These things are three-dimensional models of, the, uh, of what we think of wetlands around it. And underneath that is the Paleolithic as well. That's a Vyxelian uh, tunnel valley incised into the plain below. This, sorry. So, yeah. Can I just stop yeah. the mid flow? For those of us who don't use these kinds mm. of words every day, um, okay. we have a, I think... <coughs> tunnel valleys. Yeah. These, are the, these are not what you think of in the, in the, um, the, is it, that you see in the, in the north of England, which is these great big U-shaped valleys which are carved out by glaciers. Almost certainly these are outwash deposits where water flows out of the glaciers under considerable pressure, or underneath them indeed, and it plows and cuts out great big troughs. But what you're seeing here is you've got a relative, to, uh, relative stratigraphy with the Mesolithic surfaces here, which are represented by this river channel, and underneath you've got a Paleolithic landscape existing as well beneath it. So that's considerable depth. At that point in time, English Heritage jumped in and said, we will help you through the aggregates levy, this tax on the, on the aggregates group. And they said, we will, fu we will, we will fund another set of data <coughs> up to the British medium line, because there's a British tax after all. Um, and we got a team together to look at the Pali environment. Um, there was Ben Geary, who's been here recently, I believe. Um, Ken Thompson, Simon Fitch, a number of other people on the landscape side. And this time, we got an area of about 23,000 square kilometers, all in standard um, international terms, the size of Wales. <laughs> and it's about the same shape as well. Yeah, that's coincidence. Huh? So we've got about 60 surveys out there. And when you look at it, you can't see very much in, in, in there because the you know, data has to be processed. But just some stats to, 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 to whet your appetite. Within that, we've got nearly 1,500 kilometers of rivers, 10 estuaries, 293 kilometers of intertidal zones, salt marshes, 24 lakes, 690 kilometers of coastline. And in fact, what we got was that. It was the first approximation of a map of a Mesolithic country underneath the North Sea that has ever been produced. The best preserved prehistoric landscape in northwestern Europe. Now, from the data, I've said you can slice it and dice it, you can also strip out the original land surfaces beneath the sediments, so we have some idea, not just of the incised features like rivers, but also the topography as well. But what we really saw and what was really exciting was right in the centre of this was a massive lake in an area called the Outer Silver Pit, about the size of the Seven Estuary, about 100 kilometres long. The heart of this landscape was a huge lake. We knew it was there, we could actually see it within the seismic sections. We could create it three-dimensionally, and there's a slice through, through profile through it. Whoops. And also, we could see it was a lake. Now, actually, really cool, it said this would probably be a lake, and it is. There's the outflow channel from the western edge of it. And this would have been an area where hunter-gatherers would have, would have congregated. The reeds that you can see out there, the birds, the fish, the eels, this is an area which would have been a heartland, a large placid lake right at the centre for hunter-gatherer settlement. But it wasn't like this. This was 
not a static landscape, it was a rapidly evolving one. It was, it was a violent landscape in some ways, with, with the cave in some senses when, it, when environmental change happened. And when it happened, it could be dramatic. This is an area of this huge lake here. You can see it quite nicely. There's some um, smaller lakes and earlier valleys uh, to, to the east. But inside it, it has two huge sandbanks. They're 40 kilometers in length. Now, they cannot exist in placid lake environments. They have to form in areas where you have a large, fast-flowing currents. Um, this is, is, is therefore the point at which it stopped being a lake and it became a rather nasty estuary. An estuary with big currents, rip currents. And these, 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 these banks were forming where great big rivers were flowing into what had been the outer silver pit lake and became an estuary. And you, this is a high resolution slice through, the, um, through these two banks. And you can see underneath there are great big weedy lines. They're erosion surfaces. These rip currents are stripping out any sediments. We know there's not many sediments left in this, but it's telling us a lot about landscape change during these periods. And we can see this in a number of areas. The rivers are nice, <coughs> and as we, we plot them, there you can, this is a look, particularly good example, you can see the river channel actually inside the valley itself there. That's up, up there, actually, on the northern Dutch sector. But you can see where lakes are infilled. This is, again, a large tunnel valley, earlier tunnel valley, up here called Martin's Hole, which has been filled with sediments during the Mesolithic period. But you can also see things like this. This is an estuary, which is gradually being infilled as the sea creeps in. And, in fact, in this estuary, which is... Well, but, but, uh, not there, but actually there, you can see that there are multiple channels being formed from an original single channel. And that's what's happening as the, as the sea level rises and the estuaries themselves become discordant over time. But they're good, these things are good, because they allow us, of course, to tell us where there are sediments which we can ultimately channel. That same estuary, you can see there the channels, it has been stripped out three-dimensionally, so we can tell how much sediment there is actually within the river channel itself. And sediment is good. You are on an archaeological dig. You like dirt. It has stuff in. It has paleoenvironmental data. You try getting paleoenvironmental data from the North Sea when you don't know what to sample. Drop a core. Go out and do this if you want, but drop a core into something the size of Wales and try and hit a river. You can't, but now we can, because we know where the rivers actually are. We'll come back to that. But we've got vast amounts of things alongside it. This is a salt marsh. Completely salt marsh. You can see all the channels here. That's 300 square kilometres of hunter-gatherer resource in one go, underneath the centre of the North Sea. You've got topographic features like this. Lovely little hill, which we can see rising. The edge of a valley, living parallel, right down here somewhere only. And there's a lovely little valley out in the North Sea. Here comes the, uh, the inner silver pit from the wash coming up here. And if you want to put a hunter gatherer group to look where a game is, places like that, I suggest, are, are quite nice. Now, that made us quite interested in how some of the uh, <coughs> how active some of these landscapes actually were. Now, these features that we're starting to see, um, the channels, um, and the topography of the hills are actually a product of, of, of tectonics. Now, the North Sea is a highly active area. You're probably not aware of that, but it is. That's why oil and gas is there. There are huge salt deposits which are mobile underneath the North Sea, and they cause earthquakes. Um, they also cause land collapses. This is a collapse above a salt well. And in fact, there's a, uh, there's a river flowing through that that collapse. You also get things like this. Salt domes pushing up, producing small hills, which collapse back into themselves, called salt, uh, and, and produce um, little, 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 little um, um, lake areas as well. You can see the rivers are flowing around this particular upstanding feature here. So it's a, it's a low hill with a river flowing, flowing around it. And we've got lots of things like this. 
This, um, um, you've got to be a bit careful about this. We put this on the front of the, of the first book we published, and within days I had someone say that there was evidence for Atlantis. Mm. But, you know, <laughs> that just goes with the territory, I'm afraid. So don't push it. But, you know, it's, it's tectonic, and of course, you get things like this. The largest earthquake in, in Britain is the Dogger Bank earthquake, 6.1 on the Richter scale. Not that long ago, just pushed the, um, push the um, what, what the German talks mean off the front page of the Northern Echo, and, um, and, uh, and you, you, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's caused by salt movement, and then you can all see. So we, it's, an, it's a dynamic area, and it is on occasions massively dynamic. And of course, one of the most interesting things was the result of consequence of both instability and, um, and um, also um, removal of the ice, is things like the uh, Sorega quit, um, tsunami. So about 6,000 BC, there's a massive instability up here, which causes um, a tsunami uh, that's an area the size of Scotland suddenly shifts underneath the North Sea. And a tsunami hits the entire east coast of England, um, and you've got st um, tsunami deposits associated, for instance, with Howick, in the east of Scotland. And of course, by then, um, if there are Channel Islands out there with people living on them, well, if you saw what happened to the Maldives during the um, Boxing Day um, um, uh, tsunami event, uh, islands stopped being islands for a while. So they're, they're inundated. But this was, you know, you, you know, the point about this is a highly dynamic environment. Okay, so where were we after uh, only 18 months of work to produce what we've ju just seen? Well, we had one of these large, the best maps of a Mesolithic landscape, and that was good. We could classify it in a variety of ways, it doesn't matter about the detail. But where do we go next? Well, we thought when we could go into detail, we could, for instance, start ground truthing some of these things. And trust me, there were quite a few people who did not believe what we were saying. It was a highly contentious statement, especially amongst geologists who don't like archaeologists doing this sort of stuff. So, ground truthing was important. Could we do more? Either in, 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 in within the British sector or across the eastern sector of the Southern North Sea. Well, we were lucky in that the um, DEFRA funded the Humber Regional Environmental Characterization, which allowed mapping up to the coastline. And most of our data doesn't go to the coastline because large ocean boom vessels can't, and there are problems with um, interpretation of the seismics and shallow water, technical issues. But this allowed mapping with smaller vessels to go right up to the coastline and to test what we were doing. So, higher resolution survey, we produced an interpretation of the channels to see if they, to, which could be tested, and then we dropped great big cores directly into them because we knew they were there. And the consequence of that was, um, there we go, the various um, samples which have been taken, changes which happened some of our interpretation. And that's been the bend as well, I think. Mm. Don't usually see it from this angle. But um, looking at the um, at the cores, uh, taking out the paleoenvironmental data, and surprise, surprise, these things are coming out. It just at an early Holocene date. I am not, after all, a liar, which is good thing to do that thing. Now, we also produced a whole series of um, of um, radiometric dates for channels out there. And I'll just put them up there. Think, think, think about it, because I'm going to come back to that in a while. We were looking then, but the Americans got interested. And they said, hmm, we've got some landscapes like yours. We'll fund the other half. So we got another 26,000 square kilometers to, to work with as well. <coughs> and surprise, surprise, to the east of the area that we're working are massive deltaic formations. This is where the mass and the shelt come into the, into the, into the sea. And there's huge, huge. Um, delta and um, deltas wet and dwarfing anything we've ever seen before. Before up there's great big S um, rivers flowing into the into the silver pit as well. So we've started gradually to 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 fulfil a map of about fifty percent of the Mesolithic area of um, of, of Doggerland now. The next thing he said is, well, you know, this is a time machine because the Further north you go, the older it gets as well. So what data can we use to go into the past? Because it's 18,000 BC on the, um, on the northern shoreline. Well, this is all the data that we do have. 
Um, <coughs> plot it up. These are the 3D um, in these polygons, these white areas here. Yeah. But you notice there's great big gaps, and that's a bit of a worry. Of course, there's great big gaps because Northumberland um, doesn't have oil and gas. That's why we're not trying to be independent, I guess. But you know, there's, there's no oil and gas. But there's lots of stuff out here. These are lots of lines of 2D data, all this grey stuff. The coal board did a huge amount of survey. We did have coal for a while, you know. Um, so that sort of stuff. But so we we set up a, a project on the west coast to see if we could use the data, two-dimensional data, in the way that we'd use 3D data. 3D data is the best. There's no doubt about it. All the hard work has been taken out of it. But there are problems if you use these single lines which are interspersed. How many do you need to produce a map that's reliable? So we actually set up a, uh, an experiment in, off the west coast in the Seven Estuary and up in the um, Liverpool Bay. We did what we normally do. We produced maps like this showing landscape, showing how inundation occurred over time. And that's fine up to a point. But that's when you've got the best evidence. What about when we don't have this? So what we did was we got 3D data, and then we had to buy samples of 2D data, which had been bought, had been surveyed for a huge variety of reasons: gas lines, electricity cables, getting the internet into the island, everything. You know, it's all of this sort of stuff. And at first, we were rather worried because we got a 40% failure rate in looking at 2D lines; they just did not work. But actually, that really reflected. Um, what that because we couldn't afford many surveys, and and if you just choose to buy a survey which actually wasn't very good, or for any variety of reasons, not good for this, might have been good for what they wanted, that's a problem. As we went on, the failure rate crept down and down and down, and we could show that. But what we found out eventually was that if we got data that it was a it approximately twenty percent. Um, um, line density, which is in an area which is the sum of the line length <coughs> in the area of the study area, you started to produce maps which pretty much looked like the ones that we got from 3D data. And the point about that is that if that is the case, we can extend the area we can survey, not entirely, but largely in, in many areas, critical areas, archaeological areas, um, just using the 2D data. And that's important. Areas like Halleck certainly can have a context. The Moray of Firth, which is almost certainly an important area for large formal um, 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 roots, megafauna roots, um, we can stop with them. That was important. So we could believe the data we've got, the maps we had were good, we could extend it. Those were the best we got. But of course, you're going to say to me, one thing, what are you going to say to me? What are you going to say to me is, what about the people? Because you're just producing maps of landscape. Damn right, and I'm a landscape archaeologist, so why shouldn't I? But okay, you have to have people as well. Right. Now, we knew that this had to be of some significance. The area that we had significance in, it was, after all, this, the, 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 the central area of, of, of northwestern Europe. And you said the, the hills of Britain were not the place. The area of optimal resources of the sort that you see, for instance, later on the Band Valley. You know, these are out here. If you're going to have um, pseudo-settled areas, it's likely to be out here. And perhaps things like how the Howick House, <coughs> which um, the ex the, the, the ex at the time was suggested as a product of people being pushed off the land, i.e. people have been forced away from the, 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 de the relatively densely settled plains onto the hinterlands, forcing people to have some sort of, um, of um, proprietary right to landscape, and you suddenly start building houses, and this is quite a, a significant point, to prove ownership when, when other people, foreigners, start coming in from the landscape may be significant. And it is interesting that these houses that we see seem to form a horizon. The British suddenly start to learn to build houses in the early 8th millennium and then stop building them. So there's something happening there, yeah? Something strange is happening. Why did we need houses? But of course, the other alternative is Howick and some of these areas are a reflection of settlement on the North Sea Plain, where you have more resources as well. I don't know necessarily where, where, that's, where we're talking about. 
where to put that exactly, but you know, these things start to become important. And we can only make the decision if we've got topographic maps. There's other things as well. Um, on, for instance, at the end of the, the periods, these are early Neolithic Mikkelsberg axes. Now, they're being found on the Brown Bank. Now, the Brown Bank is very shallow. It's also an area where we may have a, a evidence, a good evidence from trawl finds of a village or a settlement, a Mesolithic settlement of this day. So why are we getting early Neolithic axes suddenly turning up, turning up on these areas? Is it, as we often say ritual, is it the lands of the ancestors where things are being, being dumped on? You know, going back, some, some, some sort of ritual deposition, that's possibly that. But I would advise slightly to say, well, hold it. What, where was the early Neolithic coastline? Now, again, I'll come back to you. Where do you think the early Neolithic coastline was? And I bet none of you think it was anything other than the coastline we have today. I bet you don't. So, what happens when you get six, four, 600 BP dates before present, four, are you 4,000 BC, out there? When you start to think, is that what the early Neolithic coastline Now. I'm not saying that's necessarily true, but if sea hedge is here, where was the coastline 2,000 years earlier? Now, I don't think many archaeologists have stopped to think about that in terms of significance of so much. I don't think so. No. No, no. I mean, there's got to be at least the possibility that we have an incipient Neolithic out there. You know? <laughs> Pastorally based. Pastorally based. But there's at least a possibility. There's a possibility, not that I've ever believed the channel was a big problem for Neolithic um, 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 colonization or movement of animals or plants, but it might have been a lot easier to get across than people have actually realized in the past. The world may have been a very different place much more recently than we've actually understood. So we've got to start to think about ways of um, looking at this landscape and dealing with it. Now, to today, <coughs> without prejudice, this was about all we had for the, um, the, the, the Mesolithic, the Danish fishing model, which is how to find fish off in Denmark. Colleagues of mine, and I respect them dearly, have produced a model and say if you go to where, where, um, where you can find fish today, you'll find Mesolithic settlement. Right? And it may work to some extent, as we've said. We, Marine resources are important. You know, if you're looking for this bloke, you know, various points at promontories on islands become important. <coughs> but we can't let that explain the whole of the uh, British, British or European Mesolithic. It can't work that way. We've got to have different ways of going about it. Um, my colleague Simon has looked at for different ways of modelling, um, modelling um, settlement populations out in the North Sea using our topographic data and looking at the, the productivity of coastlines because the coastlines, where they exist and where they get smaller and the relationship of the coastline and the amount of land behind becomes important. So, you know, we can work out a lot about, potentially, about the actual density of settlement in some of these areas, possibly. <coughs> but we're going to have to do something else if we're going to go further. Now, you will, over the next um, week, um, so you'll meet Eugene Ching, who's coming down here. Eugene's going to give you a game. And, uh, it'll be a good game. Whatever Eugene does, it's always good. But that's just one sort of the things that Eugene does. He works with me, particularly on agent-based modeling. Agent-based models are massive models which, um, which you can approximate anything from a blade of grass through to... Um, through to um, people themselves. And we, we are starting to work on using the sort of technologies that Yuji works with, agent models and gaming front ends, which is what we've got here, <coughs> to solve them if we can, we can begin to um, approximate the colonization processes of these lands. Now that we have a topography, a landscape, whether we can start clothing them with people and plants. Now, it's dynamic, and this, uh, the Doggerland, if it is anything, it's a, it's a history of a race. It's a race between the ice melting, the sea level rising, the temperature rising, 
plants colonizing areas, animals following plants, people following animals, all of which competing with the sea level rise as it comes in. It's not a static event. It has to be dynamic. And finding and um, dy creating dynamic models are what we're working on at the moment. We're hoping to use sedimentary DNA studies, shotgun um, DNA, to start looking at some of these in a couple of um, valleys to try and look at the complete range of, um, of um, evidence for paleo environments and to reconstruct these accordingly using these models. And we've been working on them for now, actually, usually for about seven years. These, this sort of thing here is actually 720 years of plant colonization going to uh, maximum optimal environments. And we can model these in small areas, but we're gradually starting to look towards both massive areas and to put people into these environments as well. Now, we're talking about um, computer, computers that handle millions and millions of individual insects, plants, and, and humans. Um, but we're going to have to do this because this is a country we cannot visit. We cannot excavate the, in this area. We can only approximate and try to understand it. But we can't ignore it. That's the one thing I would hope that we get from this. This, this lecture, we cannot ignore the extent of environmental change and the significance of it to cultural development in Northwest Europe. <coughs> Our concept of perhaps even being British may never have been anything to do with the British Isles, so at any rate, or being insular, not British, it's not British, insular. It may be more to do with when the, salt, the, 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 the Great Lake in the middle of the North Sea becomes an estuary, when it stopped being a centralizing feature and it became a barrier. You know, that's perhaps when Howick starts developing and something different starts happening. You know, but only when we start looking at how we can put people and animals onto this entirely imaginary landscape. And let's face it, it is imaginary one way or another. It's my interpretation and, and I can't use actually paint that well. So honestly, it is real. Um, it's only when we start looking at these areas in completely innovative ways that we're going to be able to do, do something with it. And it's not going to stop there. I've said, it's, it, it's a time machine. <coughs> Further north you go, the older it gets. What about the Paleolithic? Well, we couldn't possibly find anything from the Paleolithic at a depth of 120 meters. We couldn't get any evidence of that day. Well, we have already. This, this lithic was brought out on the Viking Bergen hills, not the banks, the hills, on the edge of Europe. So people were living on the edge of the ice. And we have to start thinking about what that meant. God, it's an, you know, we have to start integrating this, this. And we haven't got to just think about Britain. It's not the only place in the world, even though we'd like to think that it is. There are bigger areas with equally bigger, <coughs> big problems. I mean, the two largest submerged landscapes, of course, the Bering Straits, the area now known as Beringia, of course. And if you're looking for settlement of the Americas, at least one of the routes, of course, is from Asia across this area, but it has to be along the coastline. And it has to be because these were hyper-arid environments in the north of it. It wasn't just the problem of cold in Siberia and the Bering, in the Bering uh, land masses. It was the fact that we couldn't even get, la get shrubs to burn in most of these areas. People were using fossil bones as fuel out, of, out here. This is a very different landscape. But what about the area in Southeast Asia? No one, I hate to say it, as some the land. <laughs> I'm from the castle. Um, but you know, this is an area, the size of India, which has been lost to the sea. At the same time, the 120 meter race was a global event. It was just north the northern hemisphere. These areas, looking perhaps for the salt of rice cultivation. Well, what is rice growing? Plains, wet watery plains? Well, guess where they are now? These are big problems that are integrated with some of the real issues of archaeology globally. And I'm well, proud to say that I think we've taken, helped take a little step towards it. I understand global change just that little bit more. And, you know, 
there are other people doing a lot of good work out there, and it's all coming together now. I think the, the, the whole of <coughs> um, um, marine coastal archaeology and paleo landscape archaeology is coming to the fore today in a way that it just wasn't even there 10 years ago. 10 years ago, we were still said it's out there if, if you thought about it at all, but we can't do anything with it. Now we've got lots of people starting to look at it, and we've got data that actually means something. So, um, anyway, buy the book. <laughs> 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 <laughs>